Oh, it's just so good to be together. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. It's good. You know, we're doing our best to kind of figure out a new way of doing things around here. And so um, don't mind me when I'm doing this and, and when I'm doing like, like this in particular. It's just that there's a whole bunch of other people in other rooms all over the place. So we'll do this together and uh, make sure we all have a good experience. But you know what? This past week, I was so excited, you know, leaning into this moment of being able to come back uh, and, and gather again. I was so looking forward to it for, you know, months, literally. But this past week, despite like all of that sense of excitement, I, I felt like I got robbed this week. I, 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 it feels like robbery took place. And here's, here's what I mean. What I mean is that I, I should have been feeling like this surge of, yes, finally. But instead, what was happening was I found myself feeling like I, I got assaulted by thieves, right? I, I mean, I felt like I was shoved into the corner and beat up and, and that valuables were taken away from me. And, and the valuables that felt like they were taken were things like hope and peace and joy and even love. And it felt like those things were taken away from me, but what was actually taking place is something that uh, Jesus gave me a little clue about a long time ago, because Jesus says this in John 10, uh, verse 10. Jesus says, the thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. I want you to just read these words of Jesus out loud with me. Ready, go. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Another translation, to give them abundant life. This is Jesus saying, let me just tell you, this is what I have for you. So if it's not that, it wasn't from me. And I want to hear it that way. Jesus is saying clearly, this is my intention. This is my purpose. Abundant life for you. So if you're experiencing something other than that, it wasn't me. And then you and I need to go, then who was it? And that's what this series is about. This series, The Resistance, is about the fact that there is spiritual turbulence, spiritual warfare that takes place. And what I was experiencing this past week where suddenly it felt like hope evaporated and suddenly it felt like joy was inaccessible to me or suddenly it felt like peace was nothing but a, a distant concept, right? What was happening was I was experiencing a spiritual attack. It was supernatural attack, spiritual attack. It doesn't always look obvious. Spiritual attack doesn't always happen. It, actually, it hardly ever happens where it's like some dude in a red velvet suit with horns on it jumps out and goes, boo, hello, oh, I'm the devil, and oh, I'm here to attack you, right? It's not that. Spiritual attack usually happens in a way more like what I just described. And we need to understand what to do about it when it takes place. And so I want you to turn to the scriptures in James chapter 4. So open up your Bible to James chapter 4. You know, on a, on a practical level, what was taking place for me this past week was uh, th that it seemed like there were just too many problems that I couldn't handle them all. It felt like there was so much pressure that I probably would just burst. It seemed like there were just too many incoming sideways comments that I just didn't know how to deal with or respond to. It felt like there were too many relationship issues that, that were, were intractable, like I didn't see a way through them. And what was happening was that there was something coming at me from the devil, but what God has called me to do is what I read in James 4. And I want you to just hear this. This is God's word. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. First of all, I want to just say I'm grateful that there's always a way to purify our hearts and, and purify our hands, that Jesus Christ has made a way for every one of us to experience that being purified reality. But for today, I really want to zero in on verse 7 and make sure we take it to heart. It said again, why don't you read it out loud with me from the start? Go. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Just one more time, the last part of verse 7. Say it with me. Again, go. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. 
This is a directive to you and me, but it's also a rule for the devil. This is God's word, eternally, infallibly true. And God's word is his rule in the unseen spiritual realm. And you and I need to know that. That as much as there's a directive there for me and you, resist the devil, there's a rule in the spiritual realm. That when we do, the devil must flee. When I resist the devil, the devil must flee. So when I'm encountering that spiritual turbulence and I resist the devil, he must flee from me when I do resist. But somebody say, when I do. When I do, because sometimes I don't. Case in point, this past week, and it wasn't on purpose. It's not like I'm purposefully trying to ignore what God's word says. It's just that sometimes it kind of sneaks up on you before you're even aware of what's taking place, and you've been under a spiritual attack, and you've accepted that demonic attack. You've accepted it. And so my message today is, in a nutshell, just this. It is to know your enemy and say no to your enemy. I want you to just say this out loud with me one time. Say it. Know your enemy and say no to your enemy. This is what we've got to learn to do, to know our enemy, but to say no to that enemy. And this is what God's word is inviting you and I to do. You know, one of the great authors of the last 50 years is Dallas Willard. And what Dallas Willard said was that in the Garden of Eden, the devil didn't attack Eve with a stick, but with an idea. Let me say it again. In the Garden of Eden, the devil didn't attack Eve with a stick, but with an idea. And so often, that is the way demonic attack happens. It's this demonically inspired idea. There's so much problem. You're never going to make it. You, there's no reason for you to have any hope. You might as well just give up. There's never going to be any peace. Does that sound like anything that comes from God? Heck no. <laughs> it sounds like something that comes right from where I was just referencing, doesn't it? It's a demonically inspired idea that ultimately tries to convince you that you're powerless. And that idea needs to be sent down the drain, right? Right? Hey, so if you came to our Center Point Church campus today, you probably noticed as you walked in that there was a bunch of construction equipment out front and mounds and piles of dirt all around, and that's because we began our, our project of expanding our worship center, all for the one, this vision of reaching as many people as possible to, for a spiritual discipleship, and we, we want to make room for that. So we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it. But a couple of days ago, uh, before they just filled in the trenches, there were these trenches opened up in the ground, and I was checking out the construction, and I came over here, and I saw those open trenches, and I got down into the trenches and poured some oil in and blew a shofar into the depths of the earth to just, you know, make sure. Anyway, uh, while I was doing that, also an idea occurred to me, and check this out for a second. All right, so, so far, the only actual construction that's happened beyond the demolition is this, is setting in some of the preliminary plumbing. But as you look at these pipes, right, they, they're going to be buried. We're never going to see them again. But can you think about how crucial these pipes are? Like, these pipes have to be here. We're never going to see them again. We're not even going to think about them again. But we're not going to think about them again because they've been put in place. And what these pipes are is these are drainage pipes. These pipes are going to carry away the wastewater. Just think about this for a minute. In your life, you need to have a drainage system, don't you? You need to have a way for the, the waste, the pain, the hurt, the damage, the scars to be carried away and out of the ecosystem of your life. And it's in that life-giving connection with God that you begin to experience the benefit of a supernatural plumbing system where God begins to carry out from your life the damage and the hurt and the scars and the difficulty and the challenge that you've been through and the pain it left you with. And, and instead you get the refreshing flow of his goodness. But the plumbing system has to be in place. Yeah, so you know what? The, the plumbing system was installed 
It was installed inside of your spiritual reality the moment that you gave your life to Jesus. The minute you finally said, I need to be saved, I need to be forgiven, that spiritual drainage system was installed deep within you, it's available. And you and I, what we need to do is get better at utilizing it. And, and a couple weeks ago, Pastor James, or sorry, last week, Pastor James shared a message from Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus demonstrated for you and me how to use that spiritual drainage system. And Jesus was in the wilderness being attacked by the devil, tempted by the devil, and he demonstrated for you and me how to use that drainage system. When the devil came against him with an attack, he came back with the word of God and took that demonically inspired idea and shoved it down the drain. Each time, and that's Jesus showing you and me how it's done. And so what you and I need to learn how to do is the exact same thing. So when you're feeling that moment, right, where it just seems like there's so many problems, I'm never going to be able to figure it out. You take those, those demonically inspired ideas of powerlessness and you shove them down the drain and you grab hold of Philippians 4.13. You say, that's a lie because I can do all things through God who strengthens me, Christ who strengthens me. When you find yourself in that moment where it just seems like uh, th there's so much sorrow and that that sorrow is never going to lift from off of your life and it's just going to be permanent. You're just always going to be sorrowful and sad. You take that demonically inspired idea and you shove it down the drain and you grab hold of God. God's word and you say Nehemiah 10 8 says the joy of the Lord is my strength and so you take that demonic idea put it down the drain you find yourself where it's all the pressure and it feels like it's more than you can handle like you're gonna burst because of the pressure in your life you take the demonically inspired idea that says you're gonna blow up you shove it down the drain and you declare this truth Romans 8:37. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. This is the reality. We've got a spiritual drainage system, and it is word of God in the power of the spirit that opens that drain to flow right away. And that's what you need. That's part of what resisting the devil looks like. Resisting the devil isn't about some sort of physical match with some horned character. It's often about rejecting and refusing to embrace demonically inspired ideas. That's resistance. That's what you and I are made for. You gotta know your enemy and say no to your enemy. <laughs> so this past week, I didn't do such a good job of using the drain system. That's what I started with. And I didn't do a, job, a good job of engaging and being the resistance like I, I know better to do. But God is so good. Even when we find ourselves not resisting the devil the way we've been called to, God is so good that sometimes he brings the resistance around us to resist on our behalf so that we can still find victory. So for me, here's, here's what that looked like, resisting. The resistance came around me in one form, form of my wife, who said, let's take communion together. And we broke that bread and took in the wholeness of Jesus. And we sipped that cup and took in the mercy covering of the blood of Jesus as our shield and defense. That began to bring me up a little out of that dark corner I felt like I was in. And then there, there were some prophetic words that were shared with me from our pr prophetic team at Center Point Church. Cards written with an encouragement of the Father's heart that just lifted me up a couple more notches, and I needed that because I was feeling like I was down for the count. And then we had a, a, a worship night just for our worship team because we wanted to get everybody ready for this weekend, coming back after three months. And so here in this room, we had this, just for our worship team, a worship night. And we invited a guest, Aaron Brown, to come and, and lead worship in, uh, in this place as a guest so that our team could rest. And he, he was... He was leading worship powerfully. He's got this warrior spirit, you know, that was ringing out loud. And, but I wasn't there. I, I was still in this heavy, dark place. And so I was sitting over in the corner of this venue just weeping. <laughs> but then Aaron got to this moment while he was leading worship where he said, hey, and I wrote this song a while back, and it's kind of silly. It's childish, but I'm going to sing it anyway. <laughs> and then he just started singing this funny song. He's singing... From your shoulders, everything looks different. From your shoulders, giants look so small. From your shoulders, everything looks different. On your shoulders, giants look so small. 
And there I was trying to be all heavy and broody with my shady self in the corner. <laughs> and then this song came, and I just, I, it, it transported me. And suddenly I was not a, a, a grown man feeling all of the weight of the world on my shoulders, and instead I was a kid getting a shoulder back ride with dad. And, and suddenly, I, I, like the, the heaviness and darkness began to break in that moment. That was the resistance coming around me, doing some resisting on my behalf in the form of some worship and, and the presence of God in that moment. It began to break. It began to lift. But, but then it got better. Aaron, in the middle of that song, said, hey, you know, I know that the song sounds a little childish, but it's about to get even more silly. And then he just started singing. They're just itsy bitsy teeny weeny giants. They're just itsy bitsy teeny weeny giants. And there, <laughs> there was something so silly and whimsical about that moment that all I could do was laugh. Yeah. And in the laughter, there was something of the power of God that just came upon me and broke that heaviness, broke that weightiness, broke that shadiness, and all of a sudden, I'm whole, right? This, this was resistance on my behalf. Sometimes we do the resisting. Sometimes our brothers and sisters come around us and do some resistance on our behalf, but we end up free. Either way, we are the resistance, but we don't do this alone. We do the resisting together, church. And so I'm grateful that we get to be the resistance with one another. You know what? I want us to ask a question, though, today. And the question we need to be asking is, why is it that we are vulnerable to spiritual attack? Why is it that we are vulnerable to spiritual warfare? The short answer is because we live in this world. We're not in heaven yet. And the fullness of what Jesus envisioned when he taught us to pray, God, may your kingdom come, may your will be done, hasn't been realized in full measure. And so we live in this world, and in this world there is a spiritual adversary. Jesus names him the devil, and we need to uh, be aware of that fact. So my message today is know your enemy, so you can say no to your enemy. So let me just give some further definition of some things that the scriptures say about the devil. I don't like giving the devil a lot of credit, but I think it's important to take in uh, some of the word of God on this front. So in Luke eleven fifteen, 15, uh, the devil is called Beelzebub, the prince of demons. In John 12, 31, Jesus calls the devil the prince of this world. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, the devil is called the prince of the power of the air. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he's called the god of this world. So if you just take in just a few of those descriptive titles for the devil, you, you kind of got to realize that uh, it's not fake, that there's a reality there, and that there is some actual uh, power or authority in this figure we refer to as the devil. And, and I think it's important to recognize that. That term prince, and, and even saying the god of this world, indicates that the devil really does have an ability to broadly influence people with ideas and ideals and values and mindsets and culture that are different, let's just say it that way, from what God desires. And, and you and I need to be aware of this. Because it is in Christ that we are able to resist that influence. But there's one scripture in particular we just kind of referred to. I think you got to take to heart for a minute. Ephesians 2.2, 2, it calls him the prince of the power of the air. And if you think about this for a moment, the air, I mean, loosely understood, it's the spiritual realm. It's also the airwaves realm. And I think about this, the prince of the power of the air, does, does that one have anything to do with what's been taking place in the last month or, or three? Think about what flows through the airwaves, from one satellite to a box to a device right to your heart, right? Through the air, through the airwaves. And sure, some of what comes through those airwaves is just, you know, entertainment and information, but think about how much of that stuff is demonically inspired and inspires something demonic. Rage, fear, pride, anger, lust. Right? This is, this is kind of devil 101, right? 
But the prince of the power of the air has something to do with, with that, doesn't it? But I'm grateful that even though the term prince is used three times to describe the devil, that there is a far greater one, and that is the king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. And a prince's power is nothing compared to the power of the king. And Jesus Christ, king of kings, lord of lords, has all of the power and the final word in everything pertaining to the spiritual realm. So I want to just take to heart, though, that there's a need to be aware of what's going on. For example, 2 Corinthians 2.10 says it like this. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I've forgiven, if there's anything to forgive, I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Okay, forgiveness is great. <laughs> Verse 11. In order that Satan might not outwit us. Say the last part out loud with me. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Say that last part again, for we are not unaware of his schemes. One more time, just say it, for we are not unaware of his schemes. It's important for you and I to be aware that the devil's a schemer and to be paying attention to those schemes. Otherwise, you're going to be vulnerable to the threat without even knowing what's hitting you. So the whole point of this series is that you and I would grow up spiritually, and part of our growing up spiritually is this alertness to the fact that the devil's a schemer, and I don't need to get taken out by his schemes, but I do need to be aware of them. I need to know my enemy so I can say no to my enemy. I don't want any of you to get beat up by the devil, and I want you to know in every moment how you can stand your ground and say your no, but part of it is just being aware of the schemes, <laughs> aware of the tricks aware of the wiles, as one translation says. We gotta have an awareness. Here's what we know. 1 John 5, 19, it says this. We know that we are children of God. Start there, but don't skip the second part of that verse. We know we're children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. This is presented to us as information to be aware of. It's not something, it doesn't say, oh, we're very afraid that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. No, it's not something to be afraid of, it's something to be aware of. Why? So that you can stand your ground, so that you can say no to your enemy. This is what we know. We know that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. First John 4, 4, that's what it says. We belong to God. We have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. This is the victory you have. It's a victory in Jesus Christ and it's yours forever. So back to James 4, verse 7. Just verse 7, say it out loud with me in every venue or on the patio or at home. Ready? Go. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You, you submit yourselves to God. That is, you say, God, you're my God. You're a heavenly father who loves me. And I've messed up. I've slipped up. I've tripped up. But I receive your mercy again today. And I submit myself to you, God. I say, I'm yours, God. I say, I belong to you, God. I say, you did it when you paid the price for me on the cross. You did it all. And I submit myself gladly to you, God. Why? Because when you submit yourself to God, you're under his protection. And this is where you and I are meant to live, from a place of knowing that we're protected, strengthened, encouraged, loved, covered, shielded by the one who himself is our shield. So you submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil and say the last part, and he will flee from you. Okay, it's a happy Sunday morning for everybody, unless you're watching this later. But I want you to remember these words, and when you find the shadows lurking coming your way, you do not need to be in fear. What you need to do is exactly what you heard in this word, resist the devil and the the promise of God's word, because it's the spiritual rule for all eternity, is that that devil must flee from you. You are the resistance. Do the resisting. Let some people do some resisting for you if need be. You know, so it's Father's Day weekend, and this past week, uh, earlier in the week, I had one of those moments that and it, it, it was part of the journey up out of the dark corner, right? And it was, my, I came home one day and 
I was really heavy hearted and, and no one else was home but uh, my son Toby came and said, Dad, can I pray for you? Unsolicited, you know, but he could just see. And he said, Dad, can I pray for you? And then he sat down next to me, put his hand on my shoulder, and he prayed for me for like five minutes. I mean, five minutes of just spiritually powerful praying for his dad. And I just got to tell you, there's nothing quite like that. Seeing your, 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 your firstborn kind of come up with a spiritual power and authority, recognizing, I don't need to let my dad get beat up. I'm going to stand and pray for him. And he's praying, and breakthrough came. You know, so I'm, I'm grateful for what it means for every single one of us, that we can be the resistance. We can rise up and do the resisting that God has called us to. And, and here's what I want to say to you. The scripture that we just read is, is incredibly important, but so is this one, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Ultimately, the victory that we're talking about is secured not by what we do, but by everything Jesus did. And so what I read is when, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. And he's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This is what Jesus did. When you see the cross, it is every dark, shady, demonic thing being nailed there behind his hands and it's been paid for in full. He disarmed those powers and authorities through the cross. And for every one of us as believers, sometimes we just need to wake back up and find ourselves saying again, Jesus, thank you for the cross. And maybe right now is a good time to do that. Just everyone who's a believer, why don't you just say it out loud? Jesus, thank you for the cross. Say it, Jesus, thank you for the cross that I don't owe for my sin, that I have the hope of heaven when I die, that I get to live with power here and now, that I have the Holy Spirit filling me and flowing through me, that I'm never alone, that I walk through this life with a, a loving God taking me on this journey. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. I say it again. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Everyone who's a believer, never let your spirit within you grow stale to where you forget the inestimable weight and value of what Jesus did for you when he paid the price for your sin. And every once in a while, maybe even every day, you ought to just say, Jesus, thank you for the cross. Because that's the source of every ultimate spiritual victory you ever needed, is everything that Jesus did on the cross counts for your covering, your protection, your strengthening, your deliverance, your ability to be the resistance. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. But hey, maybe you're here today and this is all kind of new for you, you know, being in church or joining online for church. And I want you to know this, that what Jesus did on the cross is not just for a bunch of other church people. It's for every human being that ever wakes up and realizes, I need forgiveness. I want the hope of heaven. I want the power of God. And so there needs to be a moment where you cross the line, where you move from being a casual observer, a spectator, kind of curious, that's great if that's where you are right now, but there's got to be a moment where once and for all you cross the line. And crossing the line looks like, at least for most all of us, a moment where once and for all we said, man, I have a lot to still figure out, but Jesus, I figured this much out. I need you. Would you forgive my sins and save my life? And then the adventure begins. The adventure of living with God, of experiencing his presence and power in our lives. That moment's got to happen. And so I'm praying right now for somebody that that could happen in this time. And I want you to pray with me for a moment. And let's just pray that God would do some spiritual awakening for some of us. So pray with me. God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, God, that uh, yes, there's a reality of evil and the devil, but that that's a princely kind of a power, far less than the power of the king. And Jesus, we declare it in this moment. You're king. You are king of our lives. You are king over everything as pertains to us. And we do exactly what James 4 said. We submit ourselves to you, God. Once again today, we say, God, you're my God. I belong to you. And just say it to him. God, you're my God, and I belong to you. Just do what James 4 said. Submit yourself to God again today. Just do it with me. Say, God, you're my God. <laughs> you're my God. There's none other. You're my God. 
And now, for somebody else, while we're praying together, what I want to ask is that if you've never said yes to Jesus, that you would do so now. That once and for all, you'd say, Jesus, I say yes to your gift of salvation. Jesus, I say yes to your gift of the forgiveness of sins and the hope of heaven. And right now, uh, why don't you just pray with me and with your, with your heart open to God, maybe with your eyes closed, you just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I put my trust in you. And for somebody right now, this is the, the lights coming on moment for you. And if you are with me in any venue on campus or online, I want you to let us know that you are saying yes to Jesus. If you're saying yes to Jesus today, saying I want to ask Jesus to forgive my sins and save my life, I want you in every venue to either raise your hand or if you're online, just type it into the comments and say, I'm giving my life to Jesus or hit the button for raising the hand. And, and right here and now, would you just simply pray with me and say something like this, Jesus, I believe in you. I mean, it's that simple. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you paid the price for my sin when you died on the cross, and I believe you beat death. You're alive. And so I'm asking you to come into my life and be the Lord and Savior of it from this moment on. I want you all together just simply say again, Jesus, thank you for the cross. Just say it. Jesus, thank you for the cross. Because through the cross, I'm forgiven. Through the cross, there's a way for me to receive power. Through the cross, the door opens for me to the hope of heaven. Through the cross, I'm, I'm able to be born again. Through the cross, I'm able to receive mercy every single day, whenever I need it. Through the cross, I'm able to have hope because death's been defeated. <laughs> Just say it again, Jesus, thank you for the cross. Now, while we're praying together, I think it would be also important to acknowledge in these last few weeks, maybe even months, there's been a lot of tension. It's kind of gripped us, a lot of challenges and difficulties, and I feel it's important for us as we're gathering today to just cry out for a moment and simply say, Holy Spirit, come wash over me. I want you to just say that out loud. Holy Spirit, come wash over me. Just say it again with me. Holy Spirit, come wash over me. Say it again. Holy Spirit, come wash over me. Wash off the grittiness and the grime of all the stuff from the last couple months. The fear, the tension, the challenge, the anger, the rage, the violence, all the stuff. Just say it again. Holy Spirit, come wash over me. Say it. Holy Spirit, come wash over me. Why don't you stand to your feet and say it again. Holy Spirit, come wash over me. Don't you need Holy Spirit to come and wash off that junk? Don't you need Holy Spirit to come and wash away the tension and undo the knots inside of your soul. Just say it with me. Holy Spirit, come wash over me. Holy Spirit, come wash over me. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to draw us back. Draw us back into the, into the river we're made for. The river of the streams of God. And where we've gotten kind of carried away by the current of some other river, a river of rage, a river of fear, or whatever. God, we want to come back to the current of the river of God. And so Holy Spirit, draw us into that place. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.